Hello, everybody, and welcome to your talking over me. As always, I'm your host, Adam Patrick, and today I welcome Nicholas Blanchard back to the show. Nicholas and I last talked about Baruch de Spinoza on the show, starting our series on accelerationism. And today we're going to continue with the thoughts and works of one David Hume. So let's jump right into it. Enough for me. Here's Nicholas Blanchard. All right, man. Well, welcome back. And the reason that we're, we're doing this, we're continuing our series on accelerationism. And we had started with uh, Baruch de Spinoza. And then we decided on David Hume, although I can't remember why. Uh, and uh, I, I did a little bit of kind of cursory re-research on him um, a couple weeks ago before I got the new job. And, and, and I just found maybe we can work through this a little bit and you can kind of kind of help me. But uh, mm -hmm. I, I hate him now as much as I hated him <laughs> 20 years ago when I read. And it's, it's like having come out of that atheist phase of my life or whatever the fuck I was. Now I can mm -hmm. kind of see it for the nonsense that it was. But at the time, I mean, at the time it made sense to me, but I still hated him. Like, I just think he got sure. So maybe we should start with why, why David Hume, and then we can get into some of his background before we get into like the meat and potatoes of it. Oh yeah. Um, so uh, like before, um, we in our series on accelerationism, we're trying to get to uh, from the prehistory uh, of accelerationism to the modern day. Um, accelerationists like you know nick land or hmm. uh, mark fisher or something like that and um all of those roads go through deleuze basically deleuze and guattari um and uh one of deleuze's uh really early works um was a book called uh, empiricism and subjectivity uh and it is a study of uh the philosophy of david hume um and specifically uh, what uh, Deleuze was looking for is how you can derive the subject from Hume's philosophy. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot in the book sort of prefigures um, Deleuze's later philosophy in something like capitalism and schizophrenia um, or difference in repetition even. Uh, and so it's it kind of provides a base for getting into uh, Deleuzean concepts. All right. So we'll touch a little bit on his background. I mean, he was, I don't know if you'd call him like the father of the Scottish Enlightenment, but definitely a philosopher, historian, economist, um, you know, mid what early 1700s to late. Yeah. 17, I think he died actually the same year the Declaration of Independence was written. Yep. 1776. He was born in uh, 1711, if I remember correctly. Um, he went to the university of edinburgh for a while he never got a degree um and then uh he sort of bounced around uh as an independent scholar for a while um trying to get <clears throat> positions at uh, various universities in scotland edinburgh glasgow um and was rejected until i think like 17 uh, 30 or something like that or in the 20s or um anyway he got a uh, i don't want to like disgrace it because it was probably a good position but it was like a librarian position mm -hmm. uh he was he was the master of books or something at university of edinburgh until like um 1863 or something like that it's like like back when titles meant something right like they right, were just right. like trying to justify a position like it was actually you're the fucking master of books like the, the shit right right so you you would get a bunch of slaves, you know, as students to uh, to copy copy texts and stuff like that. You have to um, keep them up and all that stuff. So yeah, definitely. I, I'm sure it was a high class position uh, back in the day, not like you know university librarian today. So, but uh, yeah, that's sort of a brief history. Um, he was always frustrated by, I guess, not um, getting university positions, and um, I know that. If I remember right, the, his first university position that he was rejected for was uh, explicitly because of his um, uh, re his opinions about religion. So, and I'm, I'm sure that that's uh, that's sort of your focus of uh, <laughs> hatred coming out of him is is his uh, focus on religion. Um, I don't like 
we, we can get into sort of uh, how he um, structures metaphysics and sort of um, how he believes knowledge, uh, or you arrive at knowledge. Um, that's sort of what's in interesting to me. Uh, Hume, his dismissal of religion, and usually when you bring up something like the ontological argument or the teleological argument today um, in various circles, what will come back at you is something that is basically directly from Hume. And uh, the answer or the argument will be that um, if you can't, uh, uh, I guess, if you can't think of the uh, contradiction or if you if you think of an opposite and it's not a contradiction, then it's it's not um, or no, wait, is it the other way? Around? If it. That's. I lost it. Never mind. We'll go through it. All right. I got notes here. Right. Um, but anyway, uh, what what you'll what you'll hear is usually something from him coming back at you. So uh, I, I can't remember if we did this <clears throat> last time, but I, I I recall at least considering it on my drive home from work today, and that's that sometimes I get emails or messages from people, uh, and they're like, um, I learned a bunch of new words today on your show, and I had to <laughs> Google them to see what they mean. Which is cool. I'm glad people like did that and didn't just like dismiss it and, and move on. Um, sure. So I don't remember if we did this with the Spinoza uh, conversation, but kind of help me and the listeners here. You talked about uh, ontological and deontological. Just talk about what that means in relation to metaphysics and, and like the context that we're discussing those terms. Yeah. So um, let's see. Uh, deontological. Um, let's. Man, you're putting me on the spot here. I'm really bad at <laughs> uh, defining terms. Uh, let me just look it up. I'll get, just get a definition. Um, it's a normative ethical theory. Um, the action, what actions should be taken uh, based on sort of a logic. Um, and the ontological, uh, the definition of ontological is. Um, just uh, the study of, of knowledge, how you arrive at knowledge. Right. Okay. All right. Let's jump into it. See where we end up. Sure. Um, so uh, Hume is uh, really famous in, um, uh, I guess, analytical philosophy as uh, different from uh, continental philosophy in that um, he was sort of the... I want to say end of the empiricists and probably the the biggest of the empiricists. So here he's firmly ensconced in the Scottish Enlightenment. Um, if you follow Hume's work through, you'll see influences in Adam Smith in economics, um, Kant in um, continental philosophy. In fact, um, Kant has a quote that uh, Hume awakened him from his slumber or something like that. So, um, but you, uh, uh, John, ja John Jacques Rousseau, uh, of course, he was a uh, correspondent with him, uh, Ben Franklin, um, as far as the American tradition goes. Uh, so he has wide ranging influences all throughout sort of the enlightenment period, the um, end of the uh, middle and end of the um, 17th century uh, going into the 18th century. Um, he, his main two works were um, an inquiry, uh, the inquiry into, um, man, I should have written that down. <laughs> no, I can pull <laughs> this it up. is not going well. Hold on, hold on. While you're going, I'll, I'll look it up. Um, and then also uh, he had the treaty. So the inquiry uh, predated the treaties. Um, the treaties is sort of his um, masterwork. Now, the, the inquiries, I'm trying to remember, like the, it, they weren't received well. Weren't they considered to be sort of like um, like douchey? That's a good modern he, term. Like he was full of himself and they just went and he was really upset that they weren't received well because he'd put some yes. work into it. Right. Yeah. So the inquiry um, sort of didn't go anywhere. Um, and then the treaty sort of fell cold, which is, he was pretty bitter about, I would say. Um, and it's weird to think that uh, the, the treaties is so influential now posthumously. Right. And uh, back then it just, it didn't make a reception at all. And it's a really spiraling work um, where he touches on uh, 
a lot of different aspects of uh, the mind, how ideas are formed, and um, how we come to conclusions, sort of the ge- um, sort of the first genealogy of morals. Hmm. And then um, also sort of inventing psychology. And so uh, such a wide ranging work, it, that type of work was common back then. But I think that uh, biting off that much, um, especially given the fact that he didn't have any sort of tenured position or anything, uh, any platform to speak on when um, he was writing it, uh, probably seemed to a lot of people like uh, uh, pretty pretentious, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, um, the treatise ends with sort of a screed against religion um, and actually literally ends with a criticism of miracles. Um, And that, uh, as you can imagine, um, turned off quite a few people. (laughs) Especially especially that time, yeah. Especially at that time, yeah. So... um, Going into the uh, inquiry and the treaties, I, I don't think we need to um, treat them separately. Um, the treaties is sort of an expansion of the ideas that uh, he um, developed in the inquiry, um, and it's the treaties of, uh, of human nature. So yeah, so the inquiries, um, the inquiries came afterward. So yeah, so treatise yeah. of human nature, seventeen thirty nine, and then mm-hmm. in the um, late seventeen forties. Inquiry concern, concerning human understanding, concerning principles of morals, right? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and so um, in the treatise and the inquiry, what uh, Hume is trying to do is build a foundation of um, knowledge based on empiricism. And so uh, Hume is, as I said, uh, um, came at sort of the uh, end of um, em- empiricism, which was uh, in um, British and Scottish philosophy, um, pretty big, uh, a big, na- another big name in that, that you probably recognize is John Locke, who is sort of mm-hmm. the ur empiricist. Um, but so Hume, uh, was trying to derive, um, sort of a theory of mind and a theory of knowledge, uh, based on, uh, interaction with the outside world. So he comes up with, um, an idea of how, you get um, contents of mind uh, from experience um, and the contents. Um, he breaks it down into um, basically, I want to say four con- concepts for the contents of mind. And those are uh, impressions, ideas, and then he um, sort of uh, gets into differences between the concepts and then um, sort of, sort of has a criticism of uh, rational rationalism um, based on his empiricist ideas. And so um, the mind for Hume, uh, the mind consists of impressions and ideas. And so impressions are go- going to be um, the actual experiences that we have, um, and then. Uh, through those actual through those experiences that we have, um, we recognize an outside world, mm-hmm. um, and then uh, from those impressions, uh, we derive ideas, which are end up being copies of impressions. And so Hume has um, sort of uh, a thought experiment where um, you have an experience. Uh, let's say you're on a roller coaster. Uh, you experience a roller coaster, very intense experience, um, brings, you know, excitement, maybe joy, maybe fear, uh, apprehension, things like that. Um, and then everything that you remember is basically a copy of that. And now there's a a really interesting thing that, uh, that we can get into, um, in sort of speculative realism about that. But that's uh, what's called the copy principle, is that the ideas that we use to um, form, uh, I guess, knowledge are copies of impressions. Okay. So we we would see um, basically something like the sun rising uh, every day uh, every day for a week, right? And then we can um, draw... A conclusion that tomorrow the sun's going to rise because because it has it's happened every day 
uh, for the last week. And of course, um, you would need a longer time scale to, you know, up, update uh, your priors as far as um, whether that's going to happen. But that's sort of the idea that we uh, we have impressions that um, are repeated. And uh, from that, we draw conclusions. Um, for Hume, uh, I, complex ideas are composed of simple ideas. So simple ideas can be traced back to the uh, impression from which they were copied. So um, you have an impression of a tree, you can walk back to that tree um, and get an impression of it again, right? But it, um, as you move into complex ideas, like um, extrapolating that, you know, trees are, uh, are tall, or something like that. Hmm. Um, you can't walk back to the idea of tall, right? Because um, that that's composed of simple ideas that you've gotten. So you see 20 trees, they're all taller than you. Um, and you deduce that uh, trees are tall. Now, maybe that's not true sometimes, um, but uh, you can get that general impression. And that general impression, Impression is a complex idea that doesn't uh, go back to a simple idea that you can um, experience in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Hume would say that um, difference between uh, sort of concepts that you have are distinguished by their force and vitality, right? So if something hits you really hard, um, and this is sort of how you form ideas, how quickly quickly you would form ideas. Um, if something hits you really hard is very consequential in your life, uh, then you'll form a stronger idea of it more quickly. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas if something is sort of uh, routine and mundane, um, you will only form an impression of it um, if you have to, right? If it comes up and sort of Jordan Peterson uh, has a good ex exposition on this when he talks about the idea of a car in that you don't see a car, right, ever until, uh, well, most people don't. I do because I'm a weirdo that likes cars, but uh, most people just get in their Honda Civic and drive and never think about a car at all until it breaks, right? Mm -hmm. And then when it breaks, all of a sudden, bam, you're in a car and not just in, a, in something that's taking you from A to B. Okay. If that, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I'm tracking. All right. Um, and so um, Hume uh, is sort of, um, I would say that you can read Hume as sort of an extreme skeptic, like a super duper skeptic. Um, like we don't know that the world exists or whatever. Um, he writes like that. Uh, sometimes in the treaties and in the inquiry as well. Um, I don't think that uh, most of, uh, I haven't read a whole lot of his correspondence, but I don't think that, um, you know, he lived like that. And in my opinion, you can't live that way. Like you can't live with super duper radical skepticism. Um, empiricism is a philosophy that is rooted in skepticism of the world. Uh, so, um, you can have a gradation of skepticism and sort of analytical philosophy, uh, which springs out of the work of Hume and the Enlightenment, uh, the British Enlightenment philosophers, and um, that it's sort of based in skepticism. So uh, it's a it's an important concept uh, in the treaties and the inquiry. And then um, sort of the to ground everything in experience uh hume has two ideas that uh upon which everything derives and that's basically pleasure and pain so those are the two sort of fundamental uh aspects of um human experiences that um something either brings you pleasure and you seek it out or um brings you pain and you seek to avoid it uh, and of course, um, being sort of skeptical, uh, he believes that uh, both pleasure and pain are mental ph phenomena, um, that he wouldn't have had this back then, but um, now we would say that uh, 
it would ar- arise from sort of synapses uh, firing in your brain. Mm-hmm. That's where pain and pleasure come from. Um, so you you sort of form your ideas of pain and pleasure from um, your mental experiences. Right, because <clears throat> if you if you were some reason uh, for some reason had like didn't have the ability for those synapses to fire, like some people just don't have the wiring and they, they don't mm-hmm. feel pain. Uh, whether mm-hmm. physical pain or even emotional pain, or if, if you go even on the spectrum, right? There, right. There's something that, yep. so they didn't obviously know that at the time that comes from the, like the psych, you know, you said kind of like the father of psychology, which yes. is <clears throat> now I remember why I didn't like him way back then, <laughs> which we can get into another time. But like the whole, sure. I was very skeptical of the, the idea of modern psychology kind of just diagnosing everything down to like the, you know, just ridiculous that then just giving people drugs. And when sure, I went back yeah. and studied like the history of psychology, I remember that it wasn't really the God thing then. it was, it was that stuff that you're talking about, but no, but keep going. Sure. Yeah. Um, so he, uh, I guess, um, Hume in this, uh, Hume sidesteps the debate about external validity by, uh, bringing that all into experience. And so, um, Hume would say that, um, the subjective becomes objective in your mind. Uh, and so for everyone, they have a sort of objective reality and all that every, anyone is really doing is, are comparing objective reality. So, um, that, that's sort of a personal objective reality. And that's, uh, if you want to say, or have sort of an origin of the idea of sort of the atomistic individual in, um, uh, I guess, moral philosophy and, and political philosophy. Uh, you can see it arising from here uh, in the skepticism and the sort of personal objectivity. Um, he does reject Descartes' God, uh, de- uh, justification for external experience in God, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so he sort of, in, as Spinoza um collapsed god into nature uh as sort of the substance of a whole um hume wants to uh collapse god into an individual's experience sure and, and, and so, let me let me just follow up on something there you you said uh personal objective reality and i think you know, sometimes i try to put myself in the minds of the listeners and sometimes i'm just genuinely confused and yeah, sure. and, and sometimes you know both of those things but uh, mm-hmm. personal objective reality sounds like subjective reality to me. And, but, and so I'm just going to guess that the difference is he says there is an objective reality, but you're only going to experience some of it. And therefore, that's your personal take on this, like the, the not the sum of the parts, but the parts that you can experience rather than derive meaning however you want. Sure. And so um, there is a subjective in him and you can. Uh, uh, I, I had mentioned that book empiricism and subjectivity and you have to piece it back together. Hmm. Um, that was a sort of a really crude way of saying um, uh, ob- he believes in personal objectivity. Um, it, it's a, it would be a long conversation to sort of go through uh, Hume's uh, philosophy to, to sort of pull out the subjective. Um, he wants to say that um, there is an objective world out there um and that uh your experience of the world i don't let's see how can i explain this he wants to say that uh your experience of the world is um sort of data points right Mm. Mm -hmm. and so you're always collecting data points so um all of the ideas that you have uh from your experience uh, can be converted into data points and then sort of probability scores is what we would uh, claim now. Um, they didn't have, they didn't have the like Bayesian probability or anything like that. But um, in Hume's view, what you were doing is you were, uh, you, you were personally constructing an objective take on the world. Now, mm. when you brought that to other people, and said something to them um, that maybe they agreed with, or maybe they disagreed with. You could call that subjectivity um, if you didn't want to get into an argument. Um, but what Hume, what Hume is saying is you're cons- you're constructing an objective reality in in your head. Okay. Right? Um, so uh, Hume believes uh, very strongly in cause and effect, right? And so um, 
Hume uh, would say that, um, and this this is sort of where you get uh, the idea that uh, causality, um, or actually, what it, what's the saying that everyone uses? Uh, man, I'm just doing terrible today. <laughs> yeah, fine. Striking out all over. I, I don't know. Um, what it anyway, is. I don't know what it is either. So we're yeah. Um. So uh, he. Or uh, correlation is not causation, right? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, that yeah. that that comes from Hume, and so um, if, if you move along, um, sort of, sort of, uh, some people that are were influenced by Hume become super radical skeptical uh, skepticists, like uh, Barclay, um, who uh, claims that there's no external world at all. Um, you just sort of have experiences and construct the world yourself. Mm. Um, that's sort of a tenet of conscious realism, which I'm into conscious realism. Uh, we, we can talk about that later if you want. Um, but yeah, that, so that's sort of the, the baseline for Hume, uh, his copy principle, his theory of mind. Um, so he believes that, um, words are used to construct inter intricate ideas from uh, simple ideas, right? And so uh, this is where you get into uh, Hume's fork is where um, if you trace the lineage idea of ideas and find no impressions to substantiate them, uh, he would say you're dealing in meaninglessness and meaninglessness uh, shouldn't be pursued or relied upon, right? And so that's the sort of argument that Hume uses to dismiss a lot of uh, religious texts. And so Hume has uh, two uh, classes of mental phenomena from that um, relations of ideas, and that's a priori knowledge, and then um, matters of fact, and that's empirical knowledge. So uh, if you say something like uh, all bachelors are unmarried, Right. That would be a relationship to an idea, because if you um, take the contradiction or take the negation of that proposition, it's not a contradiction because the definition of an unmarried man is bad or a bachelor is uh, the definition of bachelor is an unmarried man. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's no contradiction there. Um, whereas a matter of fact is something where if you take its negation, um, then there is there is a contradiction. So if you would say that um, all bachelors have messy apartments, right? Um, I can find you probably a bachelor that has a pristine apartment somewhere, um, which would negate that idea. And so there would be a contradiction and that would be uh, a matter of fact, right? Okay. Uh, and that's what's called Hume's Fork. And um, so Hume's Fork is uh, the relation of ideas is knowing without checking. And if you deny it, the state uh, will lead to a contradiction. And um, matters of fact is you need, uh, for matters of fact, you need to have an impression uh, of an effect and then investigate the causes of that effect. Um, and so that that those sort of things provide the the basis of uh, Hume's phenomenology of mind. Um, Hume is uh, famous for, of course, in his investigation um, on morality of uh, coming up with the is ought problem. Um, and so Hume, um, he doesn't believe that rationality. Um, sort of a right, uh, you, you can think about things rationally, right? You're always thinking about things based on impressions you have of, um, uh, it, of phenomena in the world. So everything that you think is constructed of something in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And you get that information through um, what would, what he would call the passion. So that's joy. Um, and all of these arise, of course, from his um, pleasure and pleasure pain principle so um joy, it's very fear. spinozian too yes yes mm -hmm. yeah and so uh joy fear uh hatred things like that various emotions um those all come from experiences in the world and not something that you can sort of rationalize right and so you can't rationalize hate well you can rationalize hatred to something in the world but um you sort of uh the 
the feeling that you feel when you're hating, you can't rationalize it to something. You, you can't rationalize the feeling. Um, much like the color blue, which is fam- which is uh, that famous philosophical sort of puzzle, uh, actually comes from him. So if you if you've never seen um, the color blue, um, you, you can't derive it from anything, right? Mm-hmm. And so. Um, a, a famous sort of, um, I guess, experiment, uh, thought problem in response to something like that is the missing shade of blue that Hume actually comes up with. And he basically sidesteps the whole thing, which is sort of funny. So he, he said, he goes through and says, um, if you laid out, uh, a bunch of different shades of blue in front of someone, except for one shade is missing. Um, would the person be able to sort of derive the shade of blue and then just leaves it at that? Yeah. Um, with no answer, no answer at all. And so he just assumes that they would probably be able to um, come up with it, but uh, you know, I'm skeptical of that. I don't, I don't know if it's true. I don't know if anyone's actually done an experiment like that, but I mean, one, one would just like to logic through that think that because of like the gestalt ability of systems like people look at systems and they just naturally fill in the pieces that would Mm -hmm. they would think would be there i mean that's i I, like again i don't know if that's true too but that's a pretty commonly referred to um term or whatever in 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 general philosophy i I remember my mother going through all that like figuring that stuff out when she was going back to school yeah yeah um so yeah that is a famous problem um another sort of objection is um a tribe of people that have never seen snow um, would they be able to derive the phenomenon of snow from thinking about it? Um, uh, sort of interesting things to to puzzle through, and it's hard to do it from the frame that you're in, or me at least. Um, I've seen snow, and uh, you know I've seen the color blue, so I don't know. Um, uh, it makes me think about um, cargo cults, right? Sure. If you yeah. never like I was just putting that together yep. from a conversation I had last year with somebody, and yeah, if you don't. If you don't have the way to, re- and this is probably goes back to the whole God and religion thing. He's kind of seeing like, like, oh, those backwards people, the reason they believe in the cargo cult or they believe in, you know, the, what, what was it? Uh, I can't remember John Smith or whatever was the God or, or whatever. Cause it was something sure, written yeah. on the guy's label. Um, yep. so that, yeah, I could see that. Um, of course yeah. we could get into another discussion about like why rationalizing your way out of that turns into a whole bunch of like horrible outcomes, but we'll save that. We'll <laughs> save that for the future. Right. Yeah. So, um, in, in, a, um, coming up with the idea that, uh, every, all reason comes from, uh, reflecting upon the passions, um, he comes up with the is ought problem, which, uh, simply stated is that you can't derive an is, um, a way the world, uh, should be, uh, from an ought, or you, you can't, the way uh, the world is, from an ought the way the world should be. Let me restate that. So you can't derive the way the world is from an ought. Right. Right. Um, and so uh, that's probably the most important moral principle that um, uh, Hume comes up with. Uh, very famous today. A lot of people, you know, are trying to sort of get around it. Um, but uh, I think that that actually holds maybe um, and uh, sort of maybe you should give an example of kind of how that would play out. So somebody could visualize what you mean that you can't derive it um, and it's from an ought. So um, if I uh, sit in my room and um, I think that uh, um, grass should be, uh, I guess, blue or grass should be orange. Right. And then I go out into the world and see that grass is green uh and the greenness is the is right and um i'm saying that the world ought to be arranged in a way that grass is orange but it's always green um so i can't derive um the idea that uh grass is orange um from anything in the world because the world is giving me an is of green and the reason i kind of harp on that or wanted to focus on it for a minute is because it that particular concept has played itself out in the conversations that we've had on the show over time about political theory and economic theory, social theory, like libertarianism and how sure. when you want to see the world a particular way, um, it helps sometimes take a step back and see how it actually is and why how you want it to be isn't working. 
or how sure, it doesn't yeah. fit into the, you know, it's like fitting a square peg into a round hole. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of, um, libertarians will, will, I don't not consciously slip into an is ought, uh, distinction, but we'll sort of get caught up into it. Um, in saying, well, the state shouldn't do this, right? So the state shouldn't, uh, tax something. Um, and so, uh, they, they assume that, um, the world is, sh- should be in a state of a lack of taxation, um, and derive that that's the sort of, uh, the way, well, like the, na- like the, na- like a, the nat- it is kind of a way to rationalize to the natural state. I don't mean the state government, yeah. but like the state of nature saying like, well, that's sure. Yep. Let, let's work backwards and say, well, we, we believe this is, this particular thing is morally wrong. Therefore in all mm-hmm instances the world is naturally this way and we're trying to impose that on what actually is happening right now yeah sure yeah yeah and so um the world is in a state uh where taxation exists right and so um usually the uh the best sort of step that you can the best first step that you can take is sort of acknowledging we live in a world of, of taxes right and uh, take your sort of theory from um, the existing uh, situation that you're in, mm-hmm. right? And not, and that's sort of the Ian Capistan in your head type thing. Um, we always find uh, a way back to that one. I love that, one. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and so, um, let's see. Uh, what do I got here? I have. Uh, a few things from uh, empiricism and subjectivity. Um, so uh, this this is stepping sort of into Hume and or not Hume uh, Deleuze and Deleuze has um, I want to say a fairly unorthodox reading of Hume and a um, it sometimes uh, uh, I guess controversial. Um, and so what Hume comes up with sort of an in- individualist philosophy. And like I said, um, you can see the seeds of sort of atomistic individualism in, uh, in Hume and how he constructs psychology uh, as sort of a, um, an individual exper- uh, experiential, individual experiential uh, phenomenon. So you have an inner world um, that's personal to you uh, that um, is sort of unique from other people's inner world. Um, And so in getting to uh, subjectivity, um, what Deleuze wants to uh, get out of Hume is rebuilding uh, inner subjective uh, Mm. uh, experience with other people. And so there's something... Uh, there's a question there, uh, and a lot of people nowadays um, have sort of come to this conclusion: is that uh, you don't think on your own, right? I, I, have you heard that? Um, I, I think I think so. Maybe not worded that way, but it, sure. you need the other inputs to to. I don't know. Yeah, go for it. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So um, the idea that's sort of becoming popular now, and um, I don't know how how I feel about it, uh, but the idea is that you think social, right? Um, So you can come up with um, certain ideas on your own, but you're incredibly limited. And in human sense, what you would be limited by is the amount of impressions that you can take in. Mm. So you have 24 hours in a day, you have um, only so far you can travel. Uh, in those days, of course, it would have been severely um, limited how far you could travel. But nowadays, you know, we can travel around the world or whatever. But either way, most people aren't traveling that mu- that much, um, and most people uh, have 24 hours in a day. Well, everyone has 24 hours in a day, and um, most people, you know, have about 70 years to live and that's not a lot of time. Um, and it's not a lot of experiences to have. Mm -hmm. So you're inherently going to be limited in your ability to act uh, from a human perspective to actually think about things. So what you need to do is externalize thinking in other people. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Um, and so you're thinking about something, you bounce it off someone else, they think about it. And that's sort of a network effect of learning. And so that's sort of the way, um, oh, I want to say back propagation is structured uh, in machine learning is that it bounces off a bunch of nodes um, trying to find matches mm -hmm. between sort of a dog, a picture of a dog and an actual dog. Right. Okay. Um, and so that's sort of a move away from Hume. Now, uh, interestingly enough, um, moving away from Hume psychology, uh, in that portion of Hume psychology, um, it, a lot of people in our circles are really fond of Jonathan Haidt, uh, his moral philosophy. And Haidt, uh, I think he's actually said that um, his work is at, it's just a um, an empirical uh, uh, proof of David Hume. Um, and so he's, wor he's working on how we derive morals, right? Um, he has the moral taste bud theory where um, there's five uh, basic, um, basic morals. Uh, I can't, don't ask me to list them because I can't remember them. Um, but it's like care, harm, um, fairness, loyalty, cheating, loyalty, yeah. betrayal, authority, subversion, sanctity, degradation. Yes. Which I obviously um, just pulled out right out of my ass because I you know, <laughs> was just waiting for that concept to come up so I could drop that knowledge. <laughs> right, right, right. And so um, he, that portion of his um, philosophy uh, or philosophy of mind where we derive uh, rational, uh, our rational ideas from our um, sort of emotions is what he, uh, what uh, Height has been investigating and especially in the concept of like the elephant and the writer. Um, the elephants, your emotions, uh, and your um, passions, I guess. And then uh, the writer is basically a um, uh, sort of a weaker um, actor that is trying to sort of corral the elephant, right? And so that's sort of, in a way, um, we're moving toward that idea, away from the idea that uh, people are sort of rational individualists. Um, and moving, uh, or so we're moving away from the rational individualists. We're thinking about, um, uh, thing, uh, like knowledge as a social phenomenon. And at the same time, we're thinking about, um, personal, like you, the way you, you rationalize things as being more emotional than, uh, had previously thought. So it's kind of a push pull thing. Hmm. And it's, um, it's weird that, uh, well, I don't want to say weird, but it's, unique that that would happen with someone's idea and it's sort of uh, a testament to the breadth of sort of the ideas that Hume came up with hmm interesting stuff it, it kind of you know begs the question or at least it does with me that what what do these guys think that they're accomplishing with this work like what what does somebody like Hume what is he trying to prove I mean is it just it is it one part just I'm smart and I figured stuff out like this is my theory so I can be famous and paid well or does he really have some kind of noble goal to get to the like the baseline of knowledge so that he could do what exactly like what it what aside from making money and being popular what would be the goal to all of this so um he was primarily writing in opposition to rationalists which Spinoza was a rationalist and they so um to take a sidebar there, we use rationality um, differently than Hume and like Spinoza and everyone would have used rationality. So um, like the rationalist community or post rats nowadays are actually empiricists hmm. like Hume. Um, so uh, the idea of rational rationalism is that you can sort of deduce things from logic alone. Um, whereas Hume's contention is that um, ideas come from interaction with uh, the external world and you construct real uh, your reality from interactions with the ex external world. Um, later on, Kant will um, synthesize both of those ideas. And that's sort of why, and that's why uh, Hume is sort of at the end of this line of empiricism because um, Kant uh, synthesize rationality and empiricism and that's sort of why we use uh rationality differently now um i don't know 
that I have a good answer of why someone would do do these things. I mean, nowadays, so there's this idea that um, I came up with. Uh, well, I didn't. I don't want to say I came up with, but I act. I had an exposition of it on Twitter that um, history is sort of collapsing into internal et- an internal eternal uh, presentism, um, mm. and we are sort of um, we. It's hard for us to hold on to things uh, long enough to um, sort of build a history uh because we're always reacting right so it's yeah. it's reducing people to um reaction functions mm-hmm. and in that sort of situation what a uh, situation that we've lived in for quite a while and now it's accelerating quite a bit um with like social media and machines basically um serving up things for you to react to explicitly mm-hmm. um it's hard for us to think about doing something for pure knowledge um that might it might have been uh back then and it's as you go further back uh in history um pure knowledge as a pursuit was probably um more prestigious for people in their own mind and so um i don't know that hume would have hume probably did want some sort of fame but um i think that there were just people back then and that's sort of the if you listen to um what's his name jolly heretic uh i forget it his name's jolly heretic on youtube uh, or his channel is um him and michael woodley sort of have this idea of um that era spawning uh uh the highest level of per capita geniuses that have that we've seen Hmm. right and so um in that capacity um geniuses are basically uh they're really low in um like empathy um very high in neuroticism they uh don't mind defending people i guess Mm -hmm. um and basically uh they they exist um as a they're basically they form their life into a pure pursuit of ideas and so um, I guess the er example of this would be someone like Pythagoras, who hmm. basically started a cult of numbers, mm-hmm. right? Um, but basically, he just wanted to worship numbers, you know? <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I have a better explanation than that. And I don't know if you can um, port their experience onto our experiences, because we've uh, sort of been collapsing that. And, and of course... Uh, as the the jolly heretic um channel if you watch enough of it um and read read the read his books he has a couple books um uh, i think that uh his thesis is that we're getting dumber uh on average i've heard that from numerous people i mean that that right. in general there's just not enough i don't know it, it's it's like instead of having a wide disparity in between geniuses and i guess the opposite whatever the opposite of that is everything mm-hmm. sort of is just the crushing down into one blob of sort of IQ right. and, and, yep. and I probably, I don't know if it's because we're not really intellectually challenging ourselves because everything is just fed to us on a silver platter anytime we want it. And I was talking, mm-hmm. uh, one of my last days at the bar was talking with somebody about, and this is not like an original idea. I probably heard it somewhere and that's why we were talking about it, but that sure. when, when you want the answer to something, you don't talk to anybody about it. You pick up your phone and you ask the phone and the phone gives you the answer. So there is right, no yeah. like it, it, there's no mental gym workout going on to build the intellect. Then and, and obviously that would over time as technology gives us more and more answers and we don't have to use our brains like we're going to the gym. Uh, you could just see as it sure. genetically perpetuates generation through generation, um, which is why I'm really happy to be able to do something like this. It's a, it's an intellectual workout to be able to talk to someone sure, like yeah. you or the guests that come on. And because I do, I know I fall into that trap where I'm driving in my car and I hear something on a podcast and I just ask Siri to tell me what it means. So, you know, I, I oh, for sure. you know, yeah, I was actually in a situation. Uh, it was sort of funny. Uh, it was, I want to say like three or four months ago where um, I was, I forget what I was buying from the guy. Um, anyway, I was buying something from someone and this guy was old as hell. Um, he had to have been like 80 years old. He was like, I'll, I'll come bring it to you or whatever. 
Um, and so I texted him my address and man, he must have looked it up on like a map map, like a paper map. And um, he's he's coming. Right. <laughs> and uh, he calls me. And he's like, all right, so where do I get off? And I was like, well, what the where do you get off? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, Google Maps just tells me where to get off. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And so I had to sit there and think about it, like think about the actual street name from the interstate that mm. uh, you get off on. And then the the like number of turns it takes to get to my house mm-hmm. and sort of uh, reconstruct that for him. Now, he had that perfectly after i i had said it he knew the street he was like all right yeah i can do that and i was like if someone were to explain that to me while i was on the phone (laughs) i'd just lose it immediately yeah 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 right Mm -hmm. and so that's sort of um an exposition of the uh the principle of uh i guess what what did i call it Uh, i'd have to look let me look through the server here um, yeah, I, 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 I find a, a lot of my uh, like colloquial stories come from my interactions at Best Buy for some reason. I don't know why this is, <laughs> but I, maybe I'm just at Best Buy a lot. That's so that's where I talk to people. But um, sure. I was standing in line. That's why like two Christmases ago or something. And uh, and, you know, the people are dicking off at the cashier, or the register. And one one guy's talking to the girl. They're, they're both probably in their late teens, early 20s. And mm-hmm. the, the name MapQuest came up. And so the, the the younger one was like, I was like, oh, yeah, you remember MapQuest? Like MapQuest isn't a thing anymore. And I was next right. in line. They looked up and, and said, do you remember MapQuest? And I was like, dude, I remember maps. Like, <laughs> you know, like, I'm, like I'm almost 40. Like I remember it wasn't in high school. We had maps. If you wanted to like right, deliver, right, right. deliver pizza, I delivered pizza. Sure. You looked at the map and you charted it out and, you you know, wrote it down the directions right. and you drove to yeah. the pizza place. And, you know, I that was so obvious. And now. You know, it, maps probably aren't even correct. If you got a paper map, right. it probably doesn't even have half the streets on it that you would need to turn down. Right. Yeah. So um, I called this idea uh, historical liquidation. Um, and so this is uh, coming from a Deleuzian perspective. Um, the idea that uh, the self is a desiring machine um, that plugs itself into other desiring machines and is also plugged into by other desiring machines Um what makes uh, humans unique is the amount of agency that technology has allowed us to obtain over this pr- process of desiring. Mm. And uh, if you remember from our last conversation, we sort of got, in, got into that idea of will and agency. Um, and so what we've created uh, with, I want to say uh, like machine learning algorithms, all of our, all of our technology is what I want to say, uh, or I want to call feedism. And uh, basically it's a pull toward a perpetual desire maximization, right? Uh, a actual hedonic treadmill yeah. where um, uh, as your, your feed is not permanent, right? Um, your feed, your feed it, only exists long enough for a machine on some other side of it to get a reaction from you, to get a data point from you. Um, and then it's gone. Uh, the feed refreshes and then the machine gets new data points from you by what you react. Um, so you're in a perpetual loop of recursive reaction, uh, as you look at feeds. And I think that, um, as we, become dominated by feeds everywhere um, and interact with the world more and more through feeds. Um, We, we collapse history into the present Mm. and um, we end up in an internal present where we can never act um, because we're always reacting. You can't get to an action stage in a fetus reality um, because the by the time you've acted, the feed has refreshed and there are brand new things for you to react to. Would, would this be perhaps another way of sort of explaining or internalizing the hyper real? Sure. Yeah. 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 It's a it's sort of a layer. Was that Baudrillard? I'm trying to remember who the hyper real yes. was. Baudrillard. Okay. Yeah. Baudrillard. Yep. Yeah, and sim- simulacra and simulation. Mm-hmm. And um, so this is, uh, you can see this in uh, every once in a while, you'll come up with um, 
a picture of some what someone actually looks like versus someone what someone looks like on instagram right and mm. um it's completely different and it's actually sort of it's weirdly repulsive it shouldn't be like repul like the person could be ugly but shouldn't be repulsive right yeah but for some reason it is weirdly repulsive and uh Baud- baudrillard not to get too off into the weeds but Baud- baudrillard um actually talks about this uh as the residue of reality clinging to a mm-hmm. hyper reality and when you encounter it it's uh it's not ugly it's not um sort of evil it's just repulsive like unnatural yeah well well you want to get away from it right right is it is a, and it's a weird desire to want to get away from uh what you i guess you call mm. sort of the natural world mm. uh, and escape back into hyper reality you know what that made me think of real quick is like, have you ever watched, um, you ever seen a, a TV show or a movie that was filmed for like ultra 4k and then it, it plays mm-hmm. on, on almost like a, like it's one frame per second, a little bit faster than reality yeah. would play it. And you watch mm-hmm. it and you just go, Oh, this is so creepy. It's like too real or it's more right. than real. And I would, I probably, I was in Best Buy again when I noticed, noticed this last, <laughs> but it was, it was some movie and they're just moving in a way that is so completely unnatural from the way people or animals move in the real world. And that, that sure. just made me think of that experience. Yep. You can actually go. And, uh, if, if there's a wall of TVs at your electronics store, go and look at the various TVs and um, this might be a personal experience that uh, people have, but you can pick out TVs that really repel you Mm. uh, as far as um, the picture, you know, it might be a super crystal clear picture, but there's just something about it that um, it doesn't comport with the way you want to see things. And then of course, um, all the way on the other end of that, you have uh, soap operas, which were um, famously filmed in what, 30 frames per second or something like that to sort of get the blur that you would get in reality watching mm. something happen. Is that right? I didn't know that. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Uh, I can't remember. I know that they were filmed differently than other TV and that's why you sort of get the soap opera glow off of people. Huh? Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. I'd never heard of that before. Yeah. So, um, uh, we're off on a tangent. Oh, I like I like tangents. It's fine. <laughs> feel, feel free to uh, untangent, but I, I always like going off on those and just expanding on it. Sure. Um, so I guess um, in the ideas of uh, bringing Deleuze into sort of in the inner subjective, or not Deleuze, uh, bringing him into the inner subjective, um, which I guess we were doing some of. Um, I don't know. I don't really know where to go from there. Um, I don't have strong opinions about Hume's opinions about religion, right? Mm. Um, basically, in my – like, I don't care all that much about the ontological argument for God. I don't care about the teleological argument or any of the other arguments. Um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, if you have the experience of, of God, then that's fine with me. You don't have to argue with me about it. Right. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't need an argument that you believe in God. It's, a, it, it's not important to me whether you do or not. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, now that might be a lack of empathy on my part. Um, I'm sort of famous for that, <laughs> but, uh, it's never struck me as, um, I guess, uh, offensive uh, that um, Hume had these arguments against uh, various arguments for God, um, because I don't think it's, it's all that fruitful of a discussion to get into. It might've been back then because uh, religion had a, a hugely different role in society than it does now. Um, and actually uh, if you read through Hume and uh, the way he sort of constructs personal morality, um, you can see the seeds of sort of the secret sacred self is what someone like Paul Vanderclay mm-hmm. um, has called it. And that's sort of the idea of a, a personal personal religion rather than communal religion. And if you want to, if you're a fan of religion um, and the way that sort of religion creates bonds and structures things, um, not necessarily the way that they uh, create 
um, sort of, uh, you know, laws or anything, but just the way they structure uh, interpersonal relationships. You can probably uh, lay the destruction of um, sort of traditional religions at the feet of these ideas mm -hmm. um, of coming up with sort of a personal morality. Um, and you can see the way that it would infect, uh, I, like I have a personal relationship with Jesus. That's a um, sort of a mid last century famous idea. Um, mm -hmm and um e with evangelicals and stuff. Mm -hmm. personal relationship with jesus um that's not that's new it's not right. it's not an old idea and that sort of comes out of the idea that um you sort of create a personal morality well we've we've discussed that on on numerous episodes where when we've talked about the new atheists and the new atheists mm -hmm. are really just responding to fundamental christianity or christian fundamentalism which is really yeah in itself responding to something else, which is responding to something else, which is responding, mm -hmm. going all the way back to, you know, Hume's era where they're kind of working in the deists, maybe ish, maybe he's arguing against deism, but then deism is coming out of what it's coming out of the enlightenment, which is then a reaction to pr the Protestant reformation, which is in a reaction to the Catholic church, which you just keep going back and back and back. But to, to right. the points that you made earlier, the, the, the gaps or the eras or the epochs um, between the things get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller over time. So now you have the new right. atheists in like a 20 year block reacting sure, to, a, yeah. to a 70 year block, which is reacting to a 200 year block. Right. And then right. we're finding ourselves maybe like what, what I guess I'm trying to personally explore is going back to that much, much larger block that encompassed, you know, thousands of years of human history before these ideas sure. started to get all kind of off the rails. And I say off the rails subjectively, like people who listen or, or whatever might not agree that it's gone off the rails. They might think we're in a good place, but I would just argue, mm -hmm. you know, maybe take a walk out your front door and just poke around and maybe <laughs> we're not. So, I, you know, right. it, it's all subjective, I suppose, but it's, it's my opinion. Well, so um, I think that there are ways that you can't deny that the world's getting better. Um, that someone like Steven Pinker would identify um, in sort of aggregate statistics uh, on hunger and violence and whatever. I disagree with some of what's in sort of uh, like enlightenment now, as far as his um, statistics that he has. Um, but uh, obviously life expectancy has gotten longer now. Um, you know, I don't, a lot of people think that that's an objective good. I don't know that that's an objective good. Um, it feels good to sort of live longer and some people want to live forever. But um, I think that that's sort of a situation where once you have it, you want it. But if you never have it, you don't care about it at all. Like people that live until they're 40 and if everyone's living until 40, I don't think that that caused them any problems. Yeah. And, and but also there's, I, I think, a point worth making that just be like, I guess maybe you're saying the same thing. Just because you can have it doesn't mean you should have it. Like, ju just because, you know, like certainly modern capitalism has produced, you know, edible stuff that people can consume that will provide sure. minimal nutrients that will, you know, give them enough calories to live a certain amount of mm -hmm. time. But like, is that really a life worth living? Is that, is that, you know, it, and if you were to, to somehow create the technology or have enough medication or something or pharmaceutical products to live to 200 years old, you know, I'm not mm -hmm. going to say is that what we're supposed to do, but is that really what you would define as a quality life? And I, I'm sure many people, well, clearly many people do think that, or the boomers wouldn't be trying to live forever through this COVID pandemic, right? So sure. Yeah. 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 Um, so that's on one hand. On the other hand, you have sort of fraying of social bonds um, that some people find important um, and that are important to. So one of the interesting things, and I wrote a blog post on this a long time ago um, because it comes up periodically from time to time that people like to think about the cathedrals that were built in the Middle Ages, right? Mm -hmm. And um, they w sort of wonder aloud, uh, can we build something so beautiful? And you'll see something on Twitter come up that has this, you know, beautiful cathedral. And then uh, Wrath of Non, uh, if you follow that account, is sort of uh, famous for bringing that stuff up. Um, and the idea is that, no, we can't. But why? And to an extent, I do agree with the fact that we couldn't build um 
sort of uh, medieval cathedral anymore. But it's not like anything, any of the materials or sort of uh, some of the technologies went away, but it's not like we don't have technologies to fill those roles to actually build a cathedral like that. What we're losing is organizational capital Mm. um, or what would be called organizational capital and sort of economics is that, um, and that that's sort of built from social relationships and that's how cathedrals were, uh, were built is sort of um, a desire and social relationships Mm -hmm. to um, tourism was getting off the ground sort of in the late middle ages. Um, and so having sort of a big cathedral to pilgrimage to, um, was a big deal. Um, there was also an interesting thing, uh, it's called a bractate, the bractate, the bractate, it's a type of money that existed back then that had demurrage and so lost value, um, over time. Uh, it was called in and clipped given back out and so uh incentivized um people to sort of um spend the money quickly Mm. um that had something to do with it but i think that the big thing is that we lack the social cohesion to build something like a cathedral anymore so you can build a giant uh a giant building like um like a bank building or something but that's basically just the bank you don't you don't have any input into you know whether the bank should be there or what the bank building should look like. That's the property of the bank. Right. Um, whereas sort of cathedrals were built as um, obviously they were properties of the church, but it was supposed to be something where, you know, this reflects society. Well, I, I think, yeah, I think, I think, I think that's a great point. And, and what it sort of speaks to me is, is a, about a culture of functionality with, rather than a culture of meaning and purpose. And, mm-hmm. and I, I think even like, the people who disagree with a lot of things I say would agree with that and, pro- and probably they would find something of value in that where, where I just it makes me nervous because I don't like I don't like where that ends up in my head. I don't like, you know, the future of, of what that sounds like. Because, but then again, I don't know, it may be 10,000 years from now, like none of this will even be remembered and we'll be a completely different species that have evolved to something like that. And then we'll all look back on this and be like, you know, man. I don't know. I don't think we have the social capital to build that bank building anymore. Like they did back in the ancient (laughs) times, you know, how do I, how do I really know? So here's a funny thing about this. This is way off in the weeds, but, um, uh, my idea is that, um, we are actually, um, moving more toward forager values, um, and away from, um, farmer values. And so, um, that's, I would say that in the far future, let's say we don't destroy ourselves and we do somehow end up um, among the the stars, right? Colonizing the galaxy. Um, what will have happened to humanity will uh, the people that end up there or the things that end up there is what I want to say is not something that we would recognize as humanity because we'll, we'll one, anything worth knowing will probably be widely known hmm. uh, in the future. And two, um, we'll have altered ourselves in ways that um, are sort of uh, unrecognizable and become forager bands out in sort of colonies in space. And so as and you can see sort of the seeds of moving toward forager values now. So forager values are um, sort of reduced time preference. um, More or less sort of monogamous bonds, um, more tribalism, uh, things like that. Um, I believe that probably all of those things will be exacerbated in the future um, to to the point where, uh, oh, of course, a big uh, important part of this is that um, incomes are will, will fall to um, uh, subsistence levels. Now, subsistence level is not going to be what you think of as a sub- subsistence level now. In the future, it'll it'll be a lot more comfy i guess Mm. um if we if we develop like replicate replication machines or something like that where you can get food from a a replicator or whatever um but it won't we won't have the amount of just sort of wealth sitting around that should cushion us from in or from consequential delusions is what i think robin hansen um calls them Mm. and so in the future, they will look back on 
our time and they'll think about the ways that we have um, uh, advanced technology, but they won't think about, they won't have as much connection to us, right? It, um, as far as their orientation toward the universe. And so they are going to be writing um, fictions about our time the way that we write fictions about middle, the Middle Ages. All of our fiction is, you know, or our fantasy is written from, you know, a Middle Age, the Middle Ages. Yeah, Their I, fiction is going to be our time. I call it the, uh, the, the, the Dante start or the Dante beginning where everything just yep. gets, you know, he, he basically just invents this, this weird, glorious, gothic view of, of Christianity that he really just sure. made it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, inter that that's sort of uh, what I think is that all of their fa fantasy fiction is going to be looking back on our time and, and mm -hmm. uh, writing stories about how strange it was that we were able to indulge in uh, delusions that uh, are consequential delusions that um, actually cost us. Right. Wow. Super interesting, dude. Um, <laughs> th that's kind of a cool place to leave it unless there's something on. Um on whom he thinks that like relevant, we should bring it up before we, uh, before we wrap. Um, I don't, I don't think so. I think we hit everything. Um, as far as the thought of Hume, uh, uh, it's a good base to start as we move into, uh, Deleuze. I think that, um, one person that we probably should hit, uh, is Bergson. Mm, mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, I don't want to go Bergson is sort of a hard one to just go through the ideas. Um, I'm probably going to have to come up with sort of a story <clears throat> about the ideas because uh, they're they're kind of scattered all over the place. You know who does a so, lot of um, a lot of work on him is uh, James from the Hermetics podcast. Yes, a yes, lot of episodes yeah. on on Bergson. I, I've only listened to a couple of them, but it, it's probably more so than any other thinker. He keeps popping up every couple of months or a few months or so. Yep. And so um, Bergson is really um, in was it really influential on Deleuze. He, he wrote a book called Bergsonism, um, mm -hmm. where he sort of reconstructs Bergson's philosophy. And that's sort of the main precursor to difference in uh, repetition. Um, and then I don't know if you would actually want to do it, but Nietzsche is the other. Sure. A big philosopher that is influenced, and then um, after that, we can probably move into Deleuze. I, I don't really want to do one on Kant. <laughs> yeah, that, that's totally. I mean, there's plenty of shit on Kant. I mean, there's plenty of shit on Hume out there too. But I just, right, you know, right. I thought there was this would be a nice segue into us talking about like more fun, more fun stuff. Uh, but I, sure, Bergson yeah. would be good because that was if I, you know, ever get James on, that was one of the topics was to talk about that. So we could just do that here. And then sure, Nietzsche, yeah. Nietzsche, for me, branches not just into this, but also into what I want to talk about in the future and on other shows about um, Jünger and the concept of the okay. anarchy. Like there's a lot of Nietzsche and Stirner in Ernst Jünger. So that would be good. Sure. Both of those would be really good. Awesome. All right, dude, anything you want to um, anything you want to drop? People can contact you, anything like that? Uh, just Twitter at Cheat Seat Seacon. Um and i've been so i've been trying to you you said you were going to kick me in the ass to start writing again um <laughs> it's a lot more challenging than i thought so um i'm getting into sort of i'm trying to get myself into a habit of writing just random crap uh mm -hmm. whenever uh, on a on a schedule uh, to get back into it it's surprisingly hard to just write right it's sort of a habit that you have to yep. um develop so uh I'm trying to get back into that. Um, I, I, I have a sub stack reserved um, and I do want to get back into writing. So um, I'm, I'm inching my way toward that. So I, I remember the, the, you know, back when I read Stephen King before I realized he was an idiot, he has a book called uh, <laughs> on writing, which is, and I used sure, to yeah. do a lot of writing when I was younger. I mean, before technology, that's like all I did was read and write and play sports. Sure, so, sure. but now with all the technology and running around all the time and doing this, like he, anyway, the, his point in the book was the, the, what the first thing you should do if you want to write is just sit down and read books and then yeah. start taking notes and then start writing and just pull yourself away from the technology. And I'm in the same boat as you. Like I have a sub stack ready to go. Like I have like bits and pieces of things and it, it's like, it's such a cop out to say like, I don't have enough time in the day. Like I do, mm -hmm. I do have enough time in the day, but just because you schedule a two hour block doesn't mean you're going to have anything interesting to write about. 
You know, sure, like yeah. you kind of have to have the ideas like come to you spontaneously. You can't really plan for it, which is what makes writing so complicated or, you know, so difficult. Right. Yeah. And so I guess that um, if you wanted to uh, tie that back to Hume real quick, you can say that that's a sort of Hume's phenomenology is that you get ideas from from reading, uh, experiencing the world. Um, and then uh, into the idea of uh, historical liquidation and that um, technology seems to be stealing time from you, mm. even though you have the time. You feel like time is being stolen from you, but it's it's still there. That's how we do it on your talking over me, man. Everything always comes <laughs> back around. It's a perfectly designed show with the perfect guest, that's what I say. <laughs> All right, Nick, Nicholas, thanks, man. I really appreciate it. Yep, thank you. All right, cheers, dude. Bye. All right, everybody. That's our show for today. Thank you for listening. Thank you to Nicholas Blanchard for coming back on and having this conversation with me. And just a reminder... You're talking over me.com is the best place to go ahead, download, subscribe, and share the show. It has links to all social media, Substack, Patreon, everything on there for you to, to figure out how to use. Uh, or you can just go on any podcatcher, Spotify, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, uh, YouTube, Google, anything, and just search You're Talking Over Me, Y E R, talking with no G, over me. And. It's uh, I am Adam Patrick is the handle on Twitter and social media. And also you're talking over me at protonmail.com. All right, that's it for now. Everyone be safe, be well, and I will talk to you soon.